distinguished clergy, honorable member of parliament for Windsor to come to show our castle. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ann Doobie, and I am the current president of the Serbian Heritage Museum of Windsor. As the Serbian Orthodox Church is celebrating 800 years of autocephaly this year, the Serbian Heritage Museum, the only Serbian museum in Canada, decided to take on the enormous project of putting together a historical exhibit to honor this momentous occasion. I should note that we are the only ones in Canada commemorating this event, which we are so very excited to share with you. I would like to acknowledge and thank the committee members who have been working diligently for months preparing this exhibit. The six individuals, including one from Toronto, her name was Bronca Allen, our father, Vladimir Granic, as a historical and religious advisor, Yulka Vlajic, our curator, George Velichkovic, Mara Celic, and myself. A special... who designed, created, and with the help of George Velichkovic and the Little Light installed the exhibit. <laughs> you have dedicated more than 50 hours of her life last week to the project. She spoke of Father Radic, who was a great asset to her, who kept her focused and offered much valuable information and for this, we thank him very much. Um, we send a lot of invitations out via email, and Sraga Dragashevic, who writes for Glass of Canadian Serbs, said it best in her email sending requests for tonight's event. She stated, the promo poster is absolutely magnificent perfect for the significance of the occasion. We are certain it will be a meaningful event and another perfect exhibit. Your team works so very hard and you have been coming up with superlative exhibits this past few years. Stay the course. Your team is doing a great service for the church, for our forefathers, and for future generations." End of quote. Trust me, our hearts and souls went into this exhibit and I'm certain that you will not be disappointed. Just to let you know, the exhibit will stay up until the end of January, which will be to celebrate our Svetisava in January. In the meantime, if you wish to see it, uh, if you don't get to see it tonight, if you wish to look at it more in depth, we have volunteers manning the museum from Tuesday to Friday between 1 and 3 o'clock, or you can always make an appointment and we'll be happy to meet you and show you around. Okay, you are all aware that the Serbian Heritage Museum of Windsor is dependent on donations, and I am thankful for the financial support for this exhibit from the Gartanica Serbian Orthodox Church Board and from the Berkovich family. We have a short program tonight before opening the doors to view the exhibit. And the next person I'd like to call up to say a few words is our Honorable Member of Parliament, Cheryl Cartcastle. Thank you. I'll be really quick. It's just important to me to be able to come here and thank you all for including me and to congratulate the organizers. I know it's hard to name names because there's always people who contributed in a small way to a bigger picture and all of our contributions are important. But I did want to say I'm very excited about being able to go in and see the exhibit and we're very proud of the gem that we have here because of the Serbian community and it's very important for us to acknowledge that together and to celebrate that. So that's the reason that I'm here. Congratulations to all of you here. And finally, in order for you 
to gain a good understanding of what the exhibit is saying, I would like to call upon our father, Ronich, to give a brief lecture on the subject. address all of you tonight with dear brothers and sisters. And first and foremost, as a priest of the Serbian Orthodox Church, allow me please to express my enthusiasm and gratitude to God first for the great privilege to live in a time when our church celebrates 800 years of its existence. And it is a unique event not only for our lifetime, but for the history of the church. And today we are not only talking about history, but we are living, perhaps even creating history. And we today should see ourselves as a link in the chain of many generations who left us the heritage to preserve, improve, and pass it on to the future generations. Our hopes are that we are not a weak link but it certainly is hard to keep up with great figures and important events of the rich history of the Church. At the same time, I feel a great blessing to have this opportunity to be part of this historical exhibit here in Windsor, dedicated to this great jubilee, and to work with amazing people from the Museum of the Serbian Heritage who with much love and dedication have been working in preparation of this historical exhibit. And I was kindly asked by the museum's special committee, who has been working hard for a long time on this exhibit, to say a few words about the autocephaly of the Serbian Orthodox Church. And I must say that I noticed they said specifically a short presentation. And that's precisely, they said it because they know me from Sunday liturgies. <laughs> and it also reminded me about a church bulletin blooper, which said, the priest spoke briefly, much to the delight of the audience. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> now, I will not speak about the exhibit itself, as tonight we have here people from the museum's special committee who have been working on it for months, and they will be more confident to speak about it. And while I'll, I will not dare to speak about the exhibit, still I would like to use this opportunity to express my deepest gratitude to the board of the museum, Madame President and the members of the committee of experts for their tireless and dedicated work in the preparation of this historical exhibit. And I must mention that they are all volunteers for the museum, always looking to contribute to the general community in Windsor whenever they find the opportunity, understanding and support for their work. And may God bless their noble efforts in the future for many more years to come. Now, in my relatively short presentation, I will concentrate on the subject that was set before me, and that is the autocephaly of the Serbian Orthodox Church 800 years ago. 800 years ago. While I will be touching the theme of autocephaly as a general term, I will not dwell on any particular, or rather any other autocephaly in the history of the Church, except that of the Serbian Orthodox Church. And it would certainly be pretentious to even attempt tonight to explain the philosophy behind the dynamics of the development of the church history, let alone cover every segment of such a broad and complex, yet contemporary, interesting, and above all, important topic. Now, I mentioned philosophy. Please allow me also to mention this. I just heard a comment recently. Perhaps some women may know about philosophy. Somebody sent me a message, and it's a funny message, rather. It says, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not including it in a fruit salad. 
but philosophy is wondering whether a ketchup is a smoothie. <laughs> And for the sake of the brevity, tonight I will try to avoid philosophy and perhaps even theology. Now, according to the dogmatic teaching, the church is one. Since the head of the church is one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we find that in the Gospels and in Scripture. But although one, the church was meant to encompass the world, the entire world, the whole world. Thus, even since the apostolic times and during the first centuries of the Christian history, the Church was developing from special centers, creating thus several local churches with national characteristics, each with their own administration, yet united in faith and spirit. The Orthodox Church retained the qualities of decentralization even after the multiplication of local churches according to canons. And we begin from the earliest times, Apostolic Canon 34, First Ecumenical Council number 6, Canon 6, Second Ecumenical Council 2 and 3, Third Ecumenical Council, Canon 8, Fourth Ecumenical Council, 17 and 18 canons. Preserving at the same time teaching about the true unity of the church. Therefore, according to the dogmatic teaching, the Church is one, although she is divided on several of the separate churches. And this unity of the Church is spiritual and is visibly expressed in the unity of faith, unity of spirit, in the unity of the presbyters, that is to say, bishops, leaders, in the unity of the goal or aim, and in the unified way of canonical governance of all local churches. Again, we find that in, in, the, in the Gospels and even in the Acts of the Apostles. This unity of the church can be preserved only if the order which was established by the general church of this legislation and was adopted in the teaching of the Orthodox Catholic Church is preserved. Only under the condition of unity does the universal church acknowledge the independence of the regional churches undertake under oath to preserve that unity under canon law. Now the local churches are conditionally independent. They are independent, number one, in the election of the, their entire hierarchy and the head of their church, Apostolic Canon 34, 35, 1st Ecumenical Council 6 and 7 canons, 2nd Ecumenical Council Canon 2, 3rd Ecumenical Council 8, True law, 20, 36, 39 canons, and Antioch 9, 13, and 19. Then number two, in the hierarchical rights and privileges of one church before others. So again, their independence we see in, in those rights. So it's also mentioned in the First Ecumenical Council, Canon 7, Second Ecumenical Council, uh, Canon 2, Third Ecumenical Council 8, Fourth Ecumenical Council 12, True law, Canon 36. And three, independent in the administration and adoption of local legislation and the independent court. Again, Apostolic Canon 37, First Ecumenical Council 5, Second Ecumenical Council 2, Fourth, Fourth Ecumenical Council 19, True Law 8, Seventh Ecumenical Council 6, Haiti 20, La Nicaea 40, Carthage 18. And four, Churches are independent in nurturing the ecclesiastical customs and rituals which are not in any way in opposition to the Orthodox Christian belief. But all local churches are dependent on the dogmatic teaching of the Orthodox Catholic Church. And therefore, according to the canons, they must not and cannot, for they, as they introduce a new teaching of faith. We find it in the 2nd Ecumenical Council, Canons 1 and 7, True Law 2, Carthage 2. B, to deviate from the laws and canons of the Ecumenical Church, True Law 2, 7th Ecumenical Council 1. C, must not introduce the novelties in faith of the Church. 
Certainly not without general agreement. True law, 13, 48, 49, 32, 55, 56, 81. Seventh Criminal Council, 7, Carthage, 37. D, they must not demolish the unity of the church by trampling upon the established order. Apostolic Canons 12, 13, 15, 16, 32. First Ecumenical Council 5 and 20, Second Ecumenical Council 2 and 6, Fourth Ecumenical Council 11 and 13, True Law 56. And E, they must not affect the local rights and the quiet customs of other churches. Again, we have many canons speaking about them as well. And from these brief remarks, we see that from the outset, the church had clearly defined instructions rules and regulations aimed at preserving unity in teaching, in faith, and in spirit. The creation of autocephalous churches was never accidental. The question of granting an autocephaly was of universal significance. Thus, from the earliest times until present day, the entire church was involved. In the first centuries, it was done through the ecumenical councils. And we see autocephalies retrieved, Church of Cyprus, Church of Jerusalem, even from the earliest times during the ecumenical councils. From the time of the ecumenical councils up to the present day, the assessment of the acquired rights of a church remained under the jurisdiction of the bishops of that autocephalous church to which it sovereignly belongs at the moment of seeking autocephaly. Thus, the will of the assembly of the autocephalous church, in whose jurisdiction a part of the church seeks independence, or the consent of the mother church, is one of the important prerequisites for an autocephaly. Only the assembly of the mother church can give consent to one part of its church to separate and become, in some cases, first autonomous, and then autocephalous. And that can only be done by a church possessing full autocephaly, which means sovereign authority over that part of the church seeking independence. Without the consent of the mother church, there is no autocephaly. Otherwise, if other external factors could do it on other church territory, then that local church would be neither sovereign nor autocephalous. And violations of these rules established by the Orthodox Catholic Church since ancient times inevitably always led to schisms and are seen as anomalies. Now, we come to the question of the autocephaly of the Serbian Church. Who was the mother church in the early 13th century to that part of the Orthodox Church in what was then Serbia? Was it the Archdiocese of Ocrid or the Patriarchate of Constantinople? Now, we know from the history that it is Apostle Titus, a disciple of Apostle Paul, who is considered to be the founder of Christianity in present-day Serbian lands, as he came across the coast preaching the gospel in that region. For a short time, from 535 to 545, these regions were under the jurisdiction of the Justiniana Prima. Now, the Christianization, Christianization of Serbian tribes began during the reign of the Byzantine Emperor Heraclius, which is in the 7th century, 610 to 640. From the 8th century, the influence of Byzantium on the Serbian land was increasing, and through it, the influence of the East, that is to say, the Patriarchate of Constantinople. And for a long time, Serbs were divided between two centers, and to some extent between two jurisdictions. So we find that in the history of the church, uh, written by Vladimir Tagardashevich. Now, during the 927-971 Bulgarian Independent Church, much of the Serbian church fell under its authority, and from the 10th century up until 11th century, most of the Serbian lands and church were part of, of the Samuel state and the Patriarchate of Ohri. And after the destruction of the Samuel Empire, and the Patriarchate in 1018, Emperor Basil II established in Ohrid in 1019 a new church organization with the decree of an archdiocese, 
covering almost the entire Balkan Peninsula. And as the Serbian lands were part of the Archdiocese of Ohrid, the question arose, could she have given the autocephaly to the Serbian Orthodox Church, which was immediately answered in the negative? The short answer is that the Archdiocese of Ohrid could not grant independence to the Serbian Church because the autocephaly can only be given to one part of its territory by a completely independent autocephalous mother church and the Archdiocese of Ohrid has never canonically obtained complete autocephaly. Namely, the Archdiocese of Ohrid was created by imperial decision. An imperial decision in ecclesiastical matters were only relevant when the church gave its consent to them. Thus, after the death of Emperor Basil II, all the acts and privileges he gave to the Archdiocese of Ohrid lost all importance because the dioceses numbered in the imperial documents belonged, at least, for, at least formally, to the Patriarchate of Constantinople. True, some archbishops of Ohrid have tried to impute themselves rights that no one else has acknowledged. They tried to portray the throne of Ohrid as an extension of Justiniana Prima, but since historically it simply does not stand, these theses have never been accepted or endorsed by any church, especially the Church of the Imperial City. And in short, the Archdiocese of Ohrid never had a full autocephaly because the Archbishops of Ohrid were not elected by the Byzantine Synod, but the Church of Ohrid, rather, they were appointed by the Byzantine Emperors and ordained by the Patriarchs of Constantinople at least until the second half of the 12th century. And the Church of Constantinople, as the Mother Church, never gave consent for the autocephaly of the Archdiocese of Ohrid. That is one reason. Once again, for the brevity of the talk, I will not go into the relative and secondary conditions for the autocephaly, such as independence of the state, unanimous will among both clergy and people, ability of one part of the church to obtain autocephaly, the possibility of the independent election, and consecration of its ecclesiastical leader from among its own bishops, the possibility of forming its own courts and the entire administration. All of these conditions were uh, met by the Serbian church, and that was never questioned. But these relative and secondary conditions were not enough for an autocephaly. And I realize that tonight there is no time to go into detailed explanation for all of this. But a couple of remarks, historical remarks, may help. And I'm aware that this is um, all at the moment rather abstract to many. And I hope you will see that everything will come down to earth very soon. Um, but I would also like to acknowledge that I, I, I am aware that I'm using very technical language and I hope that uh, this is not too heavy of the information that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you tonight, but I think it's very important because that's how we understand better uh, the dynamics of granting and uh, obtaining the autocephaly of one part of the church. Now, I always remember I attended a rather small gathering and there was a professor who uh, gave a lecture, but he spoke on theology and history and somewhat similar subject that I'm sharing with you tonight. And he asked, so how are you doing so far? And then a lady very honestly, she stood up and said, well, um, I'm still confused, but at least on a, on a much higher level. <laughs> now here I would like to say a few words about legal canonical factors that really, and please bear with me just a few more minutes and I promise I'm finishing, I'm wrapping up this. Um, but this was necessary just to make a few points regarding uh, our theme tonight. So I would like to say a few words about legal, canonical factors that create autocephaly. 
And this should be easier to follow. Now, why is the autocephaly of the Serbian Orthodox Church considered to be a canonical autocephaly? The autocephaly of the Serbian Orthodox Church was considered canonical simply because Saint Sava turned to the right authority for the blessing necessary for his uh, consecration as Archbishop and later for the autocephaly. Namely, Saint Sava was a monk, an archmonk, right, on Mount Athos. Mount Athos was under the direct jurisdiction of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Thus, all the monks and clergy were under the jurisdiction and spiritual authority of the Patriarch of Constantinople. All the monks and clergy on Mount Athos were at that time and still are under the direct jurisdiction of the Patriarch of Constantinople. And Saint Sava was a clergyman under the direct jurisdiction of the Patriarch of Constantinople at that time. <laughs> Previously, we already stated that even Archdiocese of Ockley was never granted the full independence by its father church, Constantinople, at that time. Therefore, even if Saint Sava turned to Archdiocese of Ockley for the autocephaly, he would not have been able to obtain it because Ockley did not have the authority to grant it. But, and this is very important, when speaking about canonicity of the autocephaly, it is of the absolute importance the fact that Saint Sala was a monk in canonical order. And later, later on, an archmantrite, priest monk, in canonical order. And always in good standing with the canonical church. And canonicity begins there. Candidates for any church order, and certainly for the rank of a priest, a bishop, and highest orders, must be in canonical order with the church. Saint Saul was a canonical priest monk, from which rank then he was again canonically consecrated an archbishop. At no point has anyone ever disputed his canonical status and his rank while among Pathos. Thus, it would be against the canons of the Orthodox Catholic Church, and even highly problematic if Saint Saul, as a cleric of Mount Athos, had turned to anyone else except to the Patriarch of Constantinople. Saul's biographers recorded that when talking to the Patriarch of Constantinople and Emperor about the need of the Serbian Church, Saint Saul was not the only candidate, and he himself proposed one of the brothers from his entourage to be considered the Archbishop, but the choice fell on him. And it was only at the urging of the Emperor and Patriarch that Sava agreed. Of course, all this was passed by the Patriarch through the Council of the Patriarchate of Constantinople, so when it was all over, then the consecration of Sava followed on a great peace day, as we read in as it was recorded by his biographers. Now, the consecration of Saba was in the spirit of canonical regulations. And again, Apostolic Canon 1, First Ecumenical Council 4, Seventh Ecumenical Council 3, Antioch 19 and 20, Lord Isaiah 12, and so on, as well as in accordance with the established practices in the Orthodox Church. Soon after the consecration for the Archbishop, Saint Saba received the decision of the autocephaly for the Patriarch and Emperor signed by the Patriarch and all the Archbishops and Metropolitans, each with his own hand. The decision emphasized that in the future, and now this is translation of the part from the biographers, so I hope it will be uh, rather understandable than my own translation, so it's the Archbishop assert himself should make decisions with the assembly of his bishops. This first part that is important. And then the second part that is equally important is or that the bishops themselves should gather and consecrate their own archbishops. And this is the document that really speaks about the autocephaly. Now it is interesting that both biographers link the name of Peter German 
instead of manual of consecration document for the Archbishop of the Syrian Church. Now, there are a few different explanations of how this transpired. And I personally would agree with Blago Tagardashevi's explanation in his article, Anonicity of a Piety of the Cephaly of the Syrian Orthodox Church, who explains this in the following way. He says, perhaps the attention of the Mentia, one of his biographers, one of Sala's biographers, was drawn to a later document signed by Peter Gemma. Attention should also, and Gemma was successor of Patriarch Manuel, who actually gave, Patriarch Constantinople, who actually gave the autocephaly and who consecrated St. Sala at that time. So attention should also be paid here to the awareness of local churches that the creation of an autocephaly is not only a matter of the mother church and area that is separated, but of the whole Orthodox Church. Because within the autocephalous churches, there's a certain hierarchical church legal order that cannot be changed by will of individual churches alone. And there is a preserved document issued only a decade after St. Sava received autocephaly regarding the renewed Bulgarian church, which testifies to the procedure for acquiring autocephaly. Namely, upon receiving a request from Bulgaria, in this case, again, the, the, the continent patriarch of Constantinople, Yemen, also addressed all Eastern patriarchs, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, for their consent and official agreement. It was only when the patriarch received their consent that he, together with the assembly, signed and sent a document to the Bulgarian patriarch in 1235, by which the Bulgarian patriarch was established, as well as sister relations among the churches. It is interesting to note that this document, just as in the case of the Serbian church, stated the obligation to commemorate the patriarch of Constantinople and the divine services. Therefore, it is possible to assume that St. Sava received the written consent of Patriarch Manuel in principle, and only after obtaining the consent of the ortho other Orthodox patriarchs, and document was sent to, uh, to Serbia with the signature of Patriarch German at that time, who became Patriarch of Constantinople in 1222. And then that document was then read in all churches throughout the Archdiocese, and then it is how the biographers heard the name of Patriarch German. A similar thing happened in the newer history of the Serbian Orthodox Church upon the unification of the Serbian Orthodox Church and the re-establishment of the Patriarchate in 1920 by the decision of the Synod of the Patriarchate of Constantinople, number 2056 of March 19, 1920. However, an official document of this was signed by the new Patriarch of Constantinople, Meletius IV, with members of the Synod only in 1922, which was read at a solemn worship service at the Cathedral Church in Belgrade the same year. Other Orthodox of the Cephalous churches were also asked about this, which then have sent their consent and recognition. And certainly, this small ambiguity about the name of the Patriarch of Constantinople, who signed the document upon the consecration of St. Sava, does not in any way diminish the canonical correctness of the establishing of the Autocephalous Serbian Church in 1219. Finally, I would like briefly to review the only known letter of protest from the then Archbishop of Ocrit, Dimitrius Komatian, addressed to St. Sava after his consecration for the Archbishop. As we have already stated, the Archdiocese of Ocrit held jurisdiction in the western part of the Byzantine Empire, in the despotate of Epirus, or Epirus, where Theodore Comnen ruled as despot from 1215 and from 1222 to 1230 as emperor. Thus, the Epirus, or Epirus, ruler, had ambitions to fully take over the Byzantine Empire. In such ambitions of Theodore Comnen, the despot at the time, the Epirus, he brings Demetrius Comatian, Comatianos, as the most learned canonist of the time to be the Archbishop of Ocrit. 
Therefore, it is not surprising that he, Dimitri Romatia, as Archbishop of Ockrid, is sending his protest letter to Saint Sal. However, while this protest comes from a famous canonist, despite all the eloquence and emphatic sarcasm, it is not convincing at all. Initially, Dukomatian strikes on the honor of Saint Sava and attacks his personal life, saying, Sava is leaving the monastic silence from Mount Athos and returning to this tumultuous world, thus becoming a statesman, participating in the state, of, uh, in the state feasts, riding beautiful horses of the noblest breed, and indulging in ceremonial processions with various escorts. But all this has nothing to do with his consecration for the bishop and the establishing of the Apostolic Serbian Church. He then proceeds to cite specific canons by which he attempted to thwart already granted, but he at the same time does not hide that Saint Sava could have received an Episcopal act of the consecration from him as well, only if he addressed the lawful authority, according to him, the head of the Bulgarian diocese. So he never questioned the canonicity. It's only the matter of his um, um, what he wanted to accomplish. But all this indicated only a mere personal ambition, not a canonical approach, even though he was probably the most learned bishop at that time. And because Saint Sava was a clergyman of the Mount Athos, which has always been and today still is under the jurisdiction of the Patriarch of Constantinople. But what is particularly important is that all the canons cited by Homatia in his letter to Saint Sava, and this is again very interesting. So all the canons that he's quoting in his letter addressed to Saint Sava do not speak about the violations of the one who is consecrated for the bishop, but of the one who performed the consecration. So according to the canons he cited in his letter against Saint Sava and sent only to Saint Sava, not to the Peter Constantinople, but only to Saint Sava, so in his letter, Comatia would have done better if he actually had sent his letter of protest to the Patriarch of Constantinople. However, he does not send his letter to the Patriarch of Constantinople because he knows that he is not entitled to do that. And by sending the letter to Saint Sava as a young and newly consecrated bishop, he seems to have tried to intimidate him so that he might give up underestimating at the same time Sal's personality, ability, and apparent knowledge, despite his youth. And Matthias's bad intention with the letter to Saint Sal is fully manifested when three years after the independence of the Syrian Church, in 1222, he wrote a very kind letter to the new patriarch of Constantinople, in which he showered with praises and exaltation the throne of Constantinople. If he felt canonical right to do so, that was a perfect opportunity to at least mention to the Patriarch of Constantinople his dissatisfaction with the consecration of Saint Sava. And it is also strange that in his letter to Saint Sava, Comatian cites the canon which condemns the use of the nobility and the imperial decrees to establish ecclesiastical authority in a particular area, since it is, since it is well known that Homatian personally and the Archdiocese of Ockrid based all their rights solely on imperial charters, while Saint Sava, along with the consent of the emperor, also had the gramata of the church authority, and in fact, he based his rights on them. And it is also true that the Patriarch of Constantinople, uh, Germanus II, later wrote a letter of protest to Homatian 
for holding on to his ambitions to crown the Byzantine Emperor. This is something that happened uh, shortly after, after the consecration of Sava as Archbishop. And it's his response to Matthias Lindley trying to justify himself. He tries to link the Archdiocese of Ockham with the privileges granted by the Pope of Rome to Justiniana Prima. And so according to him, the Archdiocese of Belgrade not only has the same rights as Constantinople, but also the same rights as the Pope of Rome. And this was certainly a reflection of purely individual and ambitious interpretations, which we will not, at least I will not, analyze further. But it helps us put things in the right perspective, and we mention them for the sole purpose to make it clear that even in his response at such an occasion, Comatia did not protest to the Patriarch of Constantinople against the consecration of Saint Sava. And knowing the unfoundedness of Comatia's protest to him, Saint Sava also did not pay much attention to him. And according to all available sources and data, even Comatia did not insist on his protest and never took any further action against Saint Saul. And from all of the above, we can safely conclude that Saint Saul obtained the autocephaly of the Serbian Church the proper way, on a completely canonical basis. Biographers of Saint Saul, Domitian and Theodosius, clearly and univocally confirmed that the autocephaly of the Serbian Church arose after the approval of the Byzantine Emperor and that the main factor in the substantiation of this act was the consent and decision of the competent patron with his assembly of bishops, which is in accordance with the ancient customs and canons. And Saint Saul was chosen for the consecration to the rank of Archbishop while he was in good standing with the Church. And finally, no patriarch has questioned the autocephaly of the Serbian Church, and certainly never its canonicity was never questioned. And these three major facts are the key to proper understanding of the canonical context of the Orthodox Catholic Church's autocephaly in any historical analysis without exception. Thank you for your patience.